love coffee. There is nothing quite like that first hot cup in the morning, right? And with two out of three Americans drinking coffee daily, I'm definitely not the only one who's so into it. But have you ever wondered how coffee became one of the world's most beloved drinks? Today, we're gonna find that out. We'll explore how people stumble upon the secret of turning what appear to be some random beans into a delicious beverage. We'll trace its journey from the early popularity to the rise of cool cafes we know and love. And of course, we'll finally try to figure out which coffee has more caffeine in it. I'm also gonna mention a lot of fun facts, and I'm pretty sure even the biggest coffee lovers are gonna find something interesting in it. My name is Natalie and welcome to my channel, a channel where every story matters. So grab your mug, get comfy, and let's dive into the fascinating world of coffee. And because this video is not sponsored, you can leave a little like or subscribe to my channel if you're new here. I would appreciate it so, so much. Thank you. Coffee beans have been discovered such a long time ago, so we can't really trace that and say when exactly it happened. However, it's fair to mention that it definitely takes root in Africa, to be more precise, in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, in particular, is home to the greatest diversity of wild coffee varieties. And this is a clue to its origins, as all cultivated coffee in the world shows less genetic diversity. So this suggests that all coffee originated from a few plants brought to that region by humans. One popular legend traces the discovery of coffee as a beverage to an Ethiopian shepherd named Kaldi. And it's fair to mention that Ethiopia is one of the oldest Christian nations. According to the story, Kaldi burst into a monastery excitedly claiming to have made a remarkable discovery. He had noticed that his goats became extremely energetic and playful. Well, he actually said that they were dancing after eating some red beans from a certain bush. Kaldi tried the berries himself and, feeling similarly energized, rushed to share his discovery with the monks. The monks, however, were initially very suspicious of these berries and believed them to be the work of the devil. So they threw the berries into the fire, but the resulting aroma was so captivating that they decided to try them after all. It is also believed that they threw the berries in water and found that the resulting beverage was not only delicious but also energizing. The legend of Kaldi is a nice, charming tale, but it's probably not entirely accurate. While it's true that coffee originated in Ethiopia, and probably the goats really had played a very important role in this whole discovery, most likely some details were exaggerated. It is true that some cultures really used goats to test if the newly discovered plants were edible. It is also known that people initially ate the berries rather than brewing them and drinking the beverage. It was very popular to make like honey bars, similar to the energy bars we have nowadays, with coffee beans. It wasn't until much later that people found out that we can actually brew the coffee, and so the beverage we all know and love was born. And I must say that chewing on raw coffee beans was no easy feat. So to make them more palatable, people began to roast the beans and soak them in the water, which would make them way softer. People noticed the delicious flavor of the resulting liquid. By the end of the 15th century, Berber merchants had established a steady trade route, bringing African coffee to Yemen. The Yemeni part of Mocha became the world's hub for coffee imports, and the traditional coffee variety from this region became known as Arabica. Even though it actually originated in Africa and not in the Arabia. Coffee and the Safas Islamic mystics known as Safas were among the first coffee enthusiasts. They practiced long night vigils, and it's no wonder why coffee became so indispensable to them. And by the beginning of the 16th century, coffee was well known in Egypt, North Africa, and Middle East, and had become an integral part of the lifestyle for a lot of Muslims. Since alcohol is forbidden in Islam, at the time coffee was prepared in the method that we know called Turkish. The beans were roasted at each 
each meal and ground between small millstones. Then finally boiled in water in a simple pot. Only years later, wet mills used by Romans were adapted for grinding larger amounts. While this process was not complicated, it was really inconvenient for people who lived in big cities and often lacked kitchens or servants. As a result, people preferred to go to specialized establishments called coffee houses, which soon became immensely important mm. in the culture of fast-growing cities. Millions of these coffee houses or cafes sprang up in Cairo, Aleppo, and Istanbul. Those coffee houses were primarily open near universities and madrasas religious schools. As 16th century students, just like nowadays, often studied late into the night and of course enjoyed socializing outside the home. And I work from home, so I usually make my coffee at home. Gladly nowadays we have special machines that would make you a coffee in two minutes. But I do know a lot of people who love to go to cafes even every day. They would go there with their laptop, study or work while drinking their coffee. That is just not for me, but then everybody's different. Do you like to go to the cafes to work or study? So cafes have been very popular in the 15th century in the Ottoman Empire, but for completely different reasons. At the time, people actually didn't know how to make coffee at home. As simple as that. So these coffee houses quickly became the centers of both scholarly and political discussion. A cafe was a place for the free exchange of ideas and even political debate. And from the perspective of the authorities, they were hotbeds of dangerous ideas. Coffee stimulated the mind and encouraged dissent, leading to the first attempts to ban coffee. The first attempt to ban coffee and coffee houses. The first attempt to ban coffee and close the cafes occurred in Mecca in 1511. The city's theological court issued a fatwa, which is a religious ruling, condemning coffee as mind-altering substance, which is forbidden by Quran. It's worth noting that the word coffee comes from the Arabic, which originally meant wine. But this linguistic connection between coffee and wine likely arose not from the similar effects on the human body, Body, but most likely was because the color was really dark. Regardless, the Meccan theologians saw coffee's association with free thinking as a threat and quickly compared it to alcohol, banning its consumption. Nonetheless, this prohibition didn't last long. As any coffee drinker knows, it's a difficult habit to break, and people easily started protesting against the rulers who tried to take their coffee away. As a result, bans of coffee in coffee houses never lasted long, despite being implemented in various places throughout history. Intellectuals argued that unlike wine, which is prohibited as it dulls the mind and encourages immoral behavior, coffee actually clarifies the mind and promotes learning. Coffee's economic importance also played a very important role, as coffee in the mid-16th century started gaining popularity across Europe. The Europeans were buying it from from Turkey. Banning coffee would have jeopardized this very lucrative trade, which resulted in weakening the case of prohibition. So speaking of Europe, Italians were likely one of the first Europeans to try out coffee, but they didn't immediately fall in love with it. Venetian merchants who traded with the Middle East brought black coffee and of course some of the elements of Turkish designs and fashion along with other exotic goods. However, However, some people saw coffee as fascination with Islamic culture, which didn't align well with the Catholic Church, who actually saw coffee as a devilish drink brewed by infidels to tempt good Catholics. In 1600, alarmed bishops brought a petition to Pope Clement VIII to ban this Moorish mischief, not my words. To their dismay, the Pope turned out to be a coffee lover himself and refused to ban it. In fact, it is even believed he blessed it. At least that's what the Italians claim. When it comes to coffee, Italians know what they're talking about. It's no wonder that we often have this association that coffee and Italians and the Italian language are somehow connected. I'm pretty sure that happened to you to see in some fashionable coffee 
shop. The sizes would say something like venti, that seems like Italian for big, but in Italian it actually does not mean big, it just means 20. The word venti comes from Spanish. And in Spanish, it actually means tall. Furthermore, in 1683, the city of Vienna in Austria endured a siege by the Ottoman army. Merchant Kolchuki, or Kolchuki, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, volunteered to break through the Turkish blockade and seek reinforcements. He returned as a hero. As his reward, he chose large bags filled with strange green beans that was unknown in Austria then. But Kolshuki actually started out as a translator, so he knew exactly what coffee was. He opened Vienna's first coffee house that was serving the coffee with milk and sugar. This is actually the real origin of Café Viennoise, how we say in French, or Viennese, Viennese coffee. That that eventually evolved into the cappuccino, a coffee with foamed milk. That was actually named like this because the color reminded of the cappuccino monk's robes. So coffee at the time was believed to cure the melancholy indigestion. Some people even claimed that it helped with smallpox, gout, scurvy, even alcoholism. It was sold in pharmacies at very high prices. Gradually, coffee transitioned from being a medicine to a recreational drink. The Dutch East India Company needed to break the the Ottoman monopoly. And they did this by stealing the raw coffee beans from Arabia and cultivating them, first in Amsterdam's greenhouses and later in the Dutch overseas colony in Java. Soon Java almost completely took over the supply for the European market. Of course, when talking about coffee, France, where I live, and its cute little cafes, French people drinking coffee, all of this comes to mind. Or as I already mentioned, we often portray Italians drinking their coffee in the terraces, enjoying their espressos outside in the sun. But by the end of the 17th century, the real center of coffee culture in Europe had become, surprisingly, Great Britain. And I guess unless you're from the UK or you've been to the UK, you're probably a little bit surprised. If Italy invented the coffee as a beverage, then the UK really invented the coffee houses in Europe. Europe. In Britain, coffee houses became entirely new centers of civilization, quite possibly propelling the whole Europe to the age of the Enlightenment. The first English coffee house was founded in 1652 by a Jewish entrepreneur named Jacob in Oxford. And just like in these Arabic countries, coffee houses proved to be exceptionally complementary to universities. These coffee houses were actually also known as penny universities, as it would usually cost you just a penny to enter, and you would have almost unlimited access to newspapers and conversation. Reporters, called runners, went around to the coffee houses announcing the latest news. Coffee houses really offered an alternative to traditional learning, attracting a lot of intellectuals and students. Quote, the coffee houses were believed to be a place for virtuosi and wits, rather than the plebes or roues, who were commonly portrayed as people who liked to go to bars and taverns. These early coffee houses set the stage for the future establishments across Europe, becoming hubs of social exchange and intellectual exploration. Historians confirm that social status was somewhat ignored and one could participate in conversation regardless of class, rank, or political leaning which was really astonishing for a country where class and rank were so important. They even posted a document called Rules and Orders of the Coffee House, which was illustrated and printed in 1674 as a coffee broadside in these coffee houses. Quote, no man of any station need give his place to a finer man. Anyone 
anyone with a penny could enter. It was a club for people whose raison d'être was debate. Lively but civilized. These cafes had a polite and restrained style of conversation. And those who violated the rules were fined. For example, the coffee houses at the time strictly banned religious debates, as well as alcohol and gambling. Even the simple act of rising a toast that was a, a very popular gesture at the time was quickly discouraged. For the same reason, because it was actually associated with beer, people writing beer glasses, <laughs> and it didn't align well with the coffee house's refined culture. And I must mention that before coffee, England ran on a constant buzz of beer and cider, consumed by all ages throughout the day. The arrival of a non-alcoholic drink was a real game changer for the whole national mentality. And you must remember that it was the time before the tea. The tea was not so widespread at the time. Coffee's clear-headed effects arguably fueled the following decades of remarkable economic growth in Britain, ushering in the age of enlightenment. You maybe remember I mentioned mocha. So it's easy to make an assumption that the mocha coffee was invented in mocha, but it's actually not at all true. It has a very surprising origin story. While Yemeni coffee occasionally boasted a hint of chocolate in the smell and taste, the actual addition of chocolate to coffee never occurred in Yemen. As this ingredient wasn't actually available, it didn't grow there. Only centuries later, in the 17th century in Italy, chocolate imported from the Americas, from South America, finally met coffee. I believe it was in Turing, where the two were combined with milk. And only in the 20th century, people came up with the actual name mocha as mocha coffee. S speaking of the names, if you go to a really fancy coffee shop that offers a, a large variety of coffee and all the different names, and sometimes they would ask you, do you want to have a wet cappuccino, for example, or a dry cappuccino? I would mention cold brew, etc. Let's try to understand what this all means without going into much detail. Well, there actually are two ways of making coffee, by brewing and by filtering. Brewing is when you immerse the coffee in water and let it steep, no matter how you do it. It can be French press, it can be Arab press, it can be Turkish coffee pot or cold brew. All the water and the coffee are in full contact for a certain amount of time. This is really the oldest, the simplest and the most effective method to make coffee. Old European coffee makers reminded like a tall teapot with a built-in porcelain stainer where you would put ground coffee, add water and let it steep. However, in Vienna they actually started filtering coffee, which completely revolutionized the way the coffee was made. So this newer way to make coffee is actually to pass water or steam through coffee that is sitting in a filter. This is what a lot of coffee machines do, uh, all the Nespresso machines, it's kind of the same style of making coffee, if I understand correctly, of course. This means that the coffee does not actually soak in the water, but the water passes through it. This includes cone filters, gazer coffee makers, Nespresso machines, as I said, and in general, all the espresso machines. This was not done in the East. Europeans came up with this method to pass water through coffee, reducing the extraction time and, of course, the bitterness of the resulting drink. Because I must mention that all European coffee at the time was disgusting. See, Europeans exported the coffee exclusively from Arabia, from the port of Mocha, and the Ottoman Empire, which at the time controlled the southern Arabian Peninsula, was well aware of the commercial value of this monopoly and strictly monitored the export. This means that all the coffee was roasted and boiled before being sold to Europe and then transported by sea in very leaky wooden crates. And they were not at all airtight. By the end of its journey, it probably smelled like seaweed or it had like a very rotten smell. About the dry or wet cappuccino, the dry cappuccino has much more milk foam and the wet cappuccino has more milk and very little foam. Speaking of cappuccinos, so which coffee has more caffeine in it? Which is more energizing? Ooh, I've heard a lot about this. And people usually believe that 
that espresso because it's so small and usually has a very strong taste, then it probably is more energizing. But it's not at all true. Espresso is not the most energizing coffee. So there are two common beliefs between coffee bean roast level and the level of caffeine in it. Belief number one, darker roasted coffee, like French roast, contains more caffeine because it has a darker color and richer flavor. Belief number two, lighter roasted beans have more caffeine in it because roasting actually destroys the caffeine. Neither of those two are correct. In fact, the roasting process has a very insignificant effect to the caffeine. Even the darkest coffee is roasted only for about 15 minutes at the temperature that would not destroy the caffeine. We can not say that there is a very slightly higher amount of caffeine in lighter roasted beans, but it's only because the darker roast coffee is more dry and more fluffy, but this is really insignificant. The main factors that do actually affect the caffeine level in coffee are the type of beans, the brewing method, and the concentration of the beverage. The Robusta beans, for example, contain almost twice as much caffeine as Arabica beans, and quick brewing methods produce less caffeine than slow brewing. Naturally, the more coffee you use per volume of water, the stronger and and more caffeinated the drink will be. An espresso, on the other hand, is made by a very rapid extraction under pressure, like the water just quickly passes through it, so the caffeine does not have enough time to really fully extract from the beans into the beverage. So basically, the more you soak the beans in the water, the longer you do it, and the more coffee beans you put in it, the more caffeinated it will be. This is like the most important thing. On a small espresso made under the pressure of water, it's it's not gonna have a lot of coffee in, in it. The espresso is made in like 20-30 seconds and it has a very small portion and that is why the FDA suggests you drink up to 10 espressos per day, which I'm pretty sure some people do. So the most caffeinated drink, as we would say, would probably be cold brew because to make the cold brew you have to soak the coffee beans and sort of infuse it in water or milk for like 24 hours. So a lot of caffeine will be extracted from the coffee to the water or milk. Another uh, popular belief is that the coffee can sober you up. I'm just gonna say there is no scientific background. Coffee does not contain anything that would eventually sober you up. It can make you more alert or energized, but this does not make the alcohol go away from your body. So if you drink coffee or an energy drink just after drinking alcohol, it's not gonna make you sober. Not really. <laughs> It'll be just a little bit more energized and stressed but still drunk. So the rise of coffee houses in London. By the beginning of the 18th century, London had more coffee houses than any other city in the world. Maybe with a little exception of Constantinople, London's coffee houses successfully survived two crises, the plague and the great fire of London. Even after the plague epidemic, the Londoners continued to visit their favorite coffee houses. Although they were not longer free to engage in conversation with strangers. Before entering, they would scan the room and not approach even their close friends without asking about the health of the family and really receiving assurances of their well-being. So yeah, people were scared to just go and talk to strangers because you don't know if they've been sick, if somebody is sick in their family, so you can get sick as well. So people started keeping the distance from other people, even their friends. As I mentioned, in addition to coffee and conversation, English coffee houses offered newspapers, magazines, and even some of the latest books, which you could quietly read while drinking your coffee. And then, of course, discuss it with other people. Coffee houses even published their own news sheets, which eventually gave rise to the magazines like Tuttler and Spectator. And of course, people loved to gossip. It was like one of the reasons why people would really go there. And of course, it was even a place for business meetings. Some of the famous cafes were Gratian or Greek was for members of the Royal Society, where most of the famous minds of the Great Britain, including Newton and Haley, drank coffee. 
Lloyd's Coffee House became a meeting place for ship owners and like ship captains. He would usually talk about business and discuss how the industry is evolving in different countries. This gradually transformed Lloyd's from just a coffee house into one of the greatest insurance companies in Europe. Or another example would be Jonathan's Coffee House. It was next to the stock exchange, so they really posted stock prices and wholesale prices on its walls. And brokers would come there and discuss the business as well. Something similar to the internet nowadays. People would gossip, make jokes, discuss the business, the industry, other countries, etc. As I've already mentioned, anybody could enter the coffee house. With a little exception, every man could enter the coffee houses. Women were not allowed in. Maybe it was the way to keep with the Eastern traditions. Women were not allowed in London coffee houses. Or at least I would say respectable women. Unlike Italy or Austria, respectable women in England couldn't really enter the coffee houses. It was seen as something really bad because women could actually work in the coffee houses or they could own the coffee houses. They could be the waitresses but they could not be the customers. They could not participate in those discussions. Horrible times, patriarchy. The petition against coffee. So men would chat for hours, lost in conversation, and who knows, maybe some radical ideas. Naturally, whispers turned into worries amongst wives. Were their husbands neglecting their duties fueled by coffee and gasp new political ideas. They even wrote a petition against coffee. Well, actually, it pretended to be from those worried wives, all riled up about their late-night coffeeholic husbands. And I quote the petition. And then, when she approaches the nuptial bag, expecting a husband that should answer the wigger of her flames, she, on the contrary, should only meet a bat full of bones and hug a mega useless corpse. Now, King Charles II may be a tad suspicious of all this political chatter. He even tried shutting down the cafes himself. So the truth is, this petition was probably just a joke or maybe it was written by men who were told to do so by the king. Because it fueled a lot of political debates. Coffee almost became a real drug in the United States. Believe it or not, in 1911, the US almost classified coffee as a narcotic alongside cocaine. Thankfully, Coca-Cola won the court case United States versus 40 barrels and 20 kegs of Coca-Cola, proving their drink that contained caffeine wasn't addictive. Imagine if they had lost, we would now be buying coffee in pharmacies with a doctor's prescription. So if coffee was a thing in the UK, how come we don't really talk about this anymore? Well, coffee houses really thrived in 18th century in Britain, by the end of the century, tea took the stage. The British East India Company polluted the market with affordable tea, which was also way easier to make at home. Unlike cafes, tea could be enjoyed by both men and women in a more private setting. This, along with the rise in social class distinctions, led to the decline of coffee houses and the rise of tea as Britain's favorite hot beverage. And coffee houses began to seem vulgar. So Britain really voted for tea and private gatherings with people of equal status. Coffee and the American Revolution. Across the Atlantic, coffee became a symbol of rebellion in the American colonies. Protesting unfair taxes, colonists boycotted British tea and embraced coffee. Well, if you're European, and you've ever been to the US, you know that their coffee is not so great. It's pretty bad, actually. I know what I'm talking about. The Sons of Liberty, key figures in the American Revolution, met at Boston's Green Dragon Coffee House to strategize. And this wasn't an isolated incident. Years later, Parisian cafes served as meeting ground for some very famous revolutionnaires like Camille Desmoulins, who would famously call for the storming of the Bastille. It seems coffee's ability to energize wasn't limited to just morning. 
things. Coffee's history is a real paradox. In Europe and North America, it fueled revolutions against tyranny. Yet, in its place of origin, it was cultivated through horrific means. The rise of Robusta and the dark side of coffee. In 1869, a fungus nearly wiped out all the Arabica coffee plants in Asia. This disaster led to the rise of Robusta, a hardy African bean with twice the caffeine but a more bitter taste. France, with its colonies in Indochina and Southeast Asia, embraced Robusta. They quickly got used to its strong flavor, which maybe some European tourists find wild, compared to a way smoother Arabica. So if you're in Paris and you find coffee a little bit too strong, you can blame history. I think I'm just very used to this coffee so I don't even notice the difference. And just like sugar and let me know if you would like to watch a video about sugar and the really really dark history behind it, please let me know in the comments. I would really appreciate that. So coffee's dark side mirrors with a struggle for freedom. The US, a champion of liberty, only enjoyed coffee because French and Portuguese colonies had already established plantations in the Americas. Plantations built on the backs of insects enslaved Africans and the slave trade. Coffee cultivation demanded immense labor. Forests were cleared, whole populations displaced, and millions of Africans were forced into slavery. The world's leading coffee producer nowadays is a good example. To meet the growing demand, an estimated 1.5 million of Africans were brought in as slaves to toil on Brazilian coffee plantations. At the time, most of the Western countries had already banned or abolished slavery. Brazil, on the other hand, held onto slavery for much longer. And Brazil continued this horrific practice until 1888, so really close to the 20th century. Economics and politics behind coffee is a really complex story for another time. Please let me know if you enjoyed this video. You can leave a little like, leave a comment down below. I'm open for any suggestions or if you would want me to improve in anything, you can also suggest anything you want. And please let me know what topic should we discuss next. Of course, if you're new here, subscribe for more videos like this and I'll see you guys very soon. Bye bye. Thank you.